Hello folks and thank you for joining me for this reading on the Free Masonic Knowledge Channel. This reading will be titled Brother Mozart and the Magic Flute. It is by Newcomb Condi in 33rd degree. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was 28 years of age when, in the autumn of 1784, he joined a Masonic Lodge. As a pianist, his little Wolfgang had been an infant prodigy, exhibited by his father throughout Europe, but he was now a recognized and admired composer, composer living in Vienna. The very year of his initiation, his first great opera, The Marriage of Figaro, had been produced in Paris. This was, however, before the days of copyright law and the earnings of genius were meager. During the 18th century, Freemasonry in Vienna had a political as well as benevolent side. It counted as members many highly placed politicians and ecclesiastics whose idea was the regeneration of humanity by moral means. It was hated by the Catholic Church and certain despotic political authorities who deemed it dangerous both to religion and to the well-being of the state. The Church, however, even as today in certain Latin countries, did not consider it expedient to challenge high-placed persons nominally in its members but also of the fraternity. The Empress Maria Theresa had been one who was opposed to masonry and in 1743 had ordered a Viennese lodge raided, forcing its master and her husband Francis I to make his escape by a secret staircase. The Emperor Joseph II, 1780 to 1790, was favorably inclined to the fraternity, although the clergy did their best to get the lodges suppressed. Such was the Masonic milieu when Wolfgang Mozart became a master mason. He must have been greatly moved and inspired by his experience. Almost immediately he composed his Freemason's funeral music and his music for the opening and closing of a lodge. He now composed his opera, Don Giovanni, and his three great symphonies, the E flat, the G minor, and the C major, as well as a great number of concertos and chamber music works. His last great opera, The Magic Flute, opened in Vienna on the evening of September 30th, 19, I mean 1791. Mozart conducted the first two performances. When he was overtaken by his last illness, he lingered on while the opera had an unprecedented run of more than 100 consecutive performances. It is said that in his sick bed, watch in hand, he would follow in imagination the performance of the magic flute in the theater. Then he died after his 67th performance. The magic flute makes no mention of Freemasonry as such, but it has always been accepted as a Masonic opera. Musicians assert that even the music as much craft, has much craft significance, beginning in the overture with its three solemn chords in brass. In keeping with the fashion of the time, the plot is half serious, half comic, a fantasy of magic and mystery laid in a never-never land called Egypt. It depicts the ancient mysteries and presents much craft symbolism. To the Viennese of that day, the queen of the of the night was clearly unfriendly. Empress Marisa, Maria Theresa, the good Sarasto, was Ignaz von Born, an eminent scientist and Masonic leader. The hero, Tamino, was a good emperor, Joseph, uh, and the heroine, Pamina, or Pamina, the Austrian people themselves. Okay, so the first program credited the libretto or libretto to the actor producer uh Schikaneder. Okay, Schikaneder, Schikaneder, Schikaneder probably. But it is now thought that it was written by Jacecki and the friend and intimate of uh Goeth and Schiller who probably desired to remain anonymous for political reasons. The opera has remained popular through the years and is included in the present repertoire of the Metropolitan Opera Company.
Linear notes posted from a compact disc, uh, highlights Magic Flute, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, commonly referred to as the Masonic Opera. The sources and influence of the Magic Flute are many, the most obvious being Lulu or the Magic Flute by Christoph Martin Whelan, one of a collection of fairy stories published in 1786 under the title and uh, Genistan. Gen I have no idea how to pronounce that word. So this is had already inspired several singspiel productions by various companies, with such titles as Casper the Bassoon Player or The Magic Zither, but the oriental decor and magical effects taken from this source provide only one level of Mozart's work, for underlying them are per pervasive references to the mysteries of Freemasonry. Mozart, a Freemason since 1784, and Schikaneder, or Schikaneder, Schikaneder, a fellow Mason of a different lodge, had embodied much of Masonic teaching and symbolism in their opera. In using the symbols and by many accounts references to the actual rituals of Freemasonry, they may have intended to make subtle demonstration of the society's high-minded purposes. It seems at least possible, in other words, that the opera was intended in part as a defense of the Masons. For two centuries there have been rumors and speculation that Mozart was murdered by the Masons for revealing their secrets. But but this seems unlikely for several reasons. His collaborator and fellow Freemason, Schechenader, Shin <laughs> lived for another two decades. Mozart closed personal identity. Mozart's close personal identification with Masonic tenets and his frequent contact with the high-ranking leaders of the society are well documented in his letters, and it is improbable that he would have defied the society's strictures or that he would have been unaware of what he could use in a public work and what could not be revealed. The number three had a deep, deep significance for the Masons, and it keeps occurring throughout the magic flute. Three ladies, three boys, three temples, and so forth. A drawing of Schenetiker's revival uh, production of 1794 shows that in the opening scene, the three ladies kill the serpent by cutting it into three pieces. The opera's home key of E-flat, redolent of virtue, nobility, and repose, was often used by Mozart for his Masonic compositions because of its signature of three flats. Prominent in the overture is the threefold repetition of the Masonic rhythmic motto, short, long, long, also heard in Act Two of the opera itself. Also Masonic in origin are the inscriptions on the three temples, wisdom, reason, and and nature. Freemasons in the audience would have recognized the symbolic armor of the guardians during the initiation trials, the earth, air, water, fire symbolism of the trials themselves, the ladies' silver spears, Papanit Gino's golden padlock, Sarastro's uh, lion-drawn chariot, and Tamino's death-like swoon, and the queen of the knights' defeat by the powers of light. In this admirable book, The Magic Flute, Masonic Opera, Jacques Chaley makes a convincing argument that the trials of the opera's second act, as well as much that leads up to them in the first act, are modeled on the actual Masonic initiation rituals. Even an apparently unrelated incident like Tamino's fainting spell in the opening scene, for instance, is interpreted as a reference to the beginning of such rituals, when the initiate is made to lie face down as a symbol of death to old habits and thought of thought and action. Bridget Brophy, in her fine study, Mozart the Drama Drama Dramatist, uh, Drama Dramatist, <laughs> points out the origins of Masonic practices in the Illusion, Illusionian mysteries and the Orphic myths of the ancient world. She documents the Libretto's heavy debt to the life of Sethos, novel published in Paris in 1731 by Ab Jean Terrison, purporting to be a translation from an ancient Greek source.
This book recounts the initiation of its Egyptian hero into the mysteries of Isis. As Miss Brophy points out, Terrason does not, but then one would not expect him to, explicitly connect his Isaac mysteries with masonry. Indeed, it is possible that the real influence was the other way about, and that the masons borrowed hints from their own ritual from the Terrasons' fictionalized Egypt. Mozart and Schenecker, 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 uh, were also well acquainted with the works of Shakespeare. Many fascinating parallels between the magic flute and the tempest are noted in Mozart on the stage by Janos Libner. Sarastro, the opera's controlling force, is similar to Shakespeare's Pros Prospero, which each, I mean, each plans the union of the two chosen lovers, but makes the way arduous in order to strengthen the bond. Monsanto's or Masato's and Caliban are very similar creations, symbols of our baser nature to be overcome and cast off. The unworldly innocence of the three boys finds its counterpart in Ariel, Prospero's sprightly servant and messenger. Each succeeding era has seen the magic flute in its own way, and each of these interpretations has validity. Whether the opera is viewed as a light-hearted fantasy, enlightenment allegory, or veiled Masonic ritual, or a lost battle in the struggle for feminine equality, it speaks anew of magic and maturation to each successive generation. Freemasonry in Crisis Since the Masonic Lodges operated openly in Mozart's Vienna, and numbered among their members many of the highest officials of the realm, we may ask ourselves why two Masons, Mozart and Schenecker, 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 <laughs> I just cannot get that to roll off my tongue, can I? Felt it necessary to compromise Masonic silence and portray so many of the society's secret symbols and belief in a public entertainment like the Magic Flute. If they, as the eminent scholar H. C. Robbins Landon has written, risked a long shot to save the craft by an allegorical opera, what was the pearl by which the once powerful society was threatened? What forces ultimately caused their attempt to be futile, ending in the complete suppression of masonry only four years later? The answers are to be found in the revolutionary cross currents of that turbulent era, in the involvement of many of the Masons, even many of the highly placed aristocrats, in activities that threaten the thrones of Europe. Freemasonry evolved from some of the craftsmen's guilds of the Middle Ages, which helps explain its name and why its adherents refer to it as the craft. But its rise into prominence began in the mid-18th century. Its espousal of wisdom, beauty, and knowledge and truth made it attractive to adherents of Enlightenment philosophies. With their de-emphasis of traditional religion in favor of individual moral advancement, which included most of the best minds in Europe and America. Viennese Masons included Mozart, who joined in 1784, his friend and admirer, Franz Joseph Hayden, initiated in 1785, and Mozart's father, father, Leopold, who joined at his son's instigation in 1785 and advanced to the third degree of membership in just 16 days. The head of the Mozart's Lodge was Prince Nicholas Estrehazy, and Hayden's patron and high-ranking diplomat in the imperial government. Freemasonry thrived in the empire despite the enmity of the Catholic Roman Catholic Church, a papal bull condemning the craft. <laughs> papal bull. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 1738 was simply ignored in Austria and its territories, and that of the powerful Empress Maria Theresa, whose younger son, the future Leopold II, had reputedly been elevated to the 18th degree of the Scottish Rite of Masonry. But although a succession of Austrian emperors took a benign view of Masonry's espousal of the enlightened notion that all men are perfectible through reason, 
They naturally smelled treason when the certain of the Masons went a step further and argued that in a fully enlightened society there was no need for monarchs. Masonry's insistence on shrouding its inner workings in secrecy worked against it. For the code of silence allowed treasonous sects to flourish within the craft, and at the same time caused government officials to imagine Masonic excesses much greater than that those that actually occurred. In the end, the emperor felt they had no choice except to ban masonry outright. Probably the most virulently anti-monarchic sect of masonry was the Illuminati. Founded in Bavaria, in Bavaria, Bavaria, by Adam Weishaupt, a university professor in 1776. Weishaupt joined the Masons the following year and soon allied the Illuminati with them. The sect's original aim was to fight evil and defend good causes, but this was soon expanded with anti-clerical and anti royal royalist sentiments, and the Illuminati operated for only a decade and probably never had more than 2,000 members, but they panicked the royalty, who became suspicious of all masonry. The crowned heads and a good reason had good reason to connect Masonic lodges with revolutionary activities. Many of the leaders of the American colonies revolted against their British king in 1776 were Masons. And notice, 1776 in America is the date we're given always for the revolution. In 1776, in Bavaria, was the same day that Weishaupt uh, created the, you know, the Bavarian, what we know today as the Bavarian Illuminati. And, uh, and of course, we know the Illuminati never went away, just like the Templars that were eradicated back in uh, the 1300s by the Roman Catholic Church actually never went away. The temp they just went underground. Uh, to avoid getting, you know, slaughtered uh, completely, um, although most of them were slaughtered. Anyway, <clears throat> um, okay, and, and those Masons include George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and pretty much e every political presidential figure throughout uh, our history has been a Freemason. Uh, except for maybe like five of them or something, you know, I don't know. Anyway, I, I do know somewhere, but it's not recollect right now, not point. In France, Masons were behind the push for Republican government that led to the French Revolution, which incidentally went much further than that those high-minded aristocrats had foreseen and claimed most of them among its victims. The Austrian Empire or Emperor heard first hand reports of the uproar in Paris from his sister, the French Queen Marie Antoinette. Austrian attempts to control the Masons included J Joseph II's decree of 1781, forbidding any order to submit to foreign authority. This led to severing Masonic ties with the Grand Lodge of Britain and setting up Austria's own governing body, the Grosse. Lands Lodge of uh, von Osterick. And, um, yeah, don't get sidetracked, Tony. Okay, uh, yeah, in 1784, another impor imperial edict centralized the country's lodges and limited their autonom autonomy, whatever. The proliferation of local lodges was reduced. Only three remained in Vienna, and the members of each were limited to 180. Regular reports of lodge meetings and attendance had to be submitted to the emperor's police. In 1790, Joseph II died and was succeeded by his brother Leopold II. With the French Revolution in full cry, the Austrian government was becoming exceedingly alarmed about treasonous sentiments in the land and especially in the Masonic orders. That same year, a lodge of Illuminati was uncovered in Prague, and the names of high officials were increasingly mentioned in secret police reports to the emperor. As Landon points out, Austria was fast becoming a police state. Imagine that. This was a demoralizing situation for Austrian Freemasons when Mozart and Schechenader decided uh, that their singspiel would be more than merely light and entertaining, that it would demonstrate the pro 
probity and superiority of Masonic teachings. They may have had hopes of saving the craft from total suppression, but those hopes were in vain. Leopold II died just six months after the Magic Flute's premiere, and he was succeeded by his son, Francis II. The imperial government, under the young and inexperienced Francis, became dominated by conservative advisers and consequently swung even further to the right. In June of 1795, an order came down to close all Masonic lodges and other secret societies and Freemasonry ceased to exist in Austria for more than a century. And I thank you for joining me for this edition of this reading on the Freemasonic Knowledge Channel.